Mario Illustrious Makinami plays one of the most important roles in the Rebuild series, not to mention Evangelion as a whole. Her influence not only affects the tone, but completely shifts the theme of a 25-year-old story into something completely different. This means then that in order to understand Evangelion's current iteration, one must first understand Mari's role and purpose. What makes this complicated is that Mari also happens to be one of Evangelion's most underdeveloped characters, with her limited appearances offering little to no information regarding her origins, nor the nature of her relationships with Nerve and the other Evangelion pilots. It doesn't help that Mari only exists in the Rebuild series, prompting us to question if her haphazard inclusion was ever necessary. In fact, after 1.0, Mari just shows up, briefly acting as a foil, contrasting the serious tone of the plot with her carefree and exuberant attitude before we are offered a truncated backstory at the end of the final film. Despite her narrative shortcomings and disjointed integration into the plot, Mari is tremendously important for the conclusion of the Evangelion story, which is why today we're going to do what the Rebuild series should have done, and explain the reasons behind her creation, explore her thematic function, and the in-universe implications of her existence. Hello Funkers, Tony Funk here, and in this short we're going to analyze Mari Illustrious Makinami and explore her purpose in the greater scope of the Evangelion story. In order to do so, however, we must first understand the reasoning behind her creation and the intention series creator Hideaki Anno and his staff had with her inclusion. Mari was first conceived during the early stages of Evangelion 2.0's production after the executive producer of the film, Toshimichi Otsuki, requested a new female character to create more interest for the film. Hideaki Anno, who was the film's screenwriter at the time, accepted the request, stating that the character's inclusion would help differentiate the rebuild films from the original series. After Mari's initial approval, Ano decided to use Asuka and Rei's naming conventions and gave Mari the surname Makinami as a reference to Japan's maritime self-defense force Ayanami series destroyer of the same name. Mari's other surname being Illustrious came from the English aircraft carrier called the HMS Illustrious, also following Ano's naming trend. Mari's first name, however, was a derivative of the name Mariko, which was borrowed from one of Ano's wife's mangas. What's interesting, is that Mari's provisional name Mariko stuck until the later stages of her character development, meaning that her name wasn't even the first components of her creation. Before her name and personality were cemented, Mari's appearance became the first component of her development. According to Satomoto, Ano requested Mari's design to be inspired by British school uniforms by describing her appearance as, and I quote, British style and Christian missionary school style, encouraging Satomoto to infer what he meant by saying, I don't know, create an image from the words. When Satomoto pressed for clearer instructions, Ano handed him multiple pictures of British schoolgirls. This became the basis for Mari's plaid skirt, tie, and button up, replicating British private school attire. Not only was Mari's iconic uniform inspired by British apparel, but also her plug suit, which was meant to resemble fencing breeches with the cross hatch pattern on Mari's legs and arms. Ano's vision for Mari then was that she was a British member of the International Project Evangelion Agency, or IPEA. The reasoning for Mari's foreign origins, however, were not story-driven, but rather a way to introduce a character who would attract new audiences due to her unique features. Among some of Mari's unique design choices, Satomota decided to give her eyeglasses, something which was considered difficult to animate for action sequences during the original run of Neon Genesis Evangelion. This distinction, then, was meant to help her stand out from the other EVA pilots as well as appeal to fans of the Mega Neko trope, which refers to female characters whose sole appeal is wearing glasses. Mari's unique design was then premiered to a live audience during a screening of Evangelion 1.0 at the Milano Theater in Shinjuku to a resoundingly positive reaction. Though Mari's design was successful in creating a fresh element to Evangelion's homogenous art style, her implementation to the story proved to be significantly more troubling. Despite Mari's creation being approved by Anno, he regarded her inclusion to the story as problematic, causing him to struggle to develop Evangelion 2.0 script. It is during the first drafts of 2.0 in which Anno began to develop Mari's personality, deciding on making her vastly different from the other existing female characters. 
uncomfortable with the idea of overtly modifying the pre-existing plot of Neon Genesis Evangelion. He decided to delegate Mari's personality traits to his protege, Kazuya Tsuramaki, and Neon Genesis Evangelion screenwriter, Yoji Enokido, by giving them vague directions as to how he wanted Mari to act. By doing this, Anna hoped that by allowing others to refine Mari's personality, he could bring a new element into the Rebuild series without feeling like he was butchering his own work. According to Kazuya Tsuramaki, however, Anno's direction seemed contradictory, causing Mari's prototype to have multiple personalities. Mari's undefined characterization resulted in her having a wide range of roles throughout Evangelion 2.0's multiple drafts. In Evangelion 2.0 Complete Records Collection, which contains a series of interviews with Hideaki Anno, Anno admitted that he did not know where to fit Mari into the film, citing that he feared her inclusion would diminish Asuka's role as a pivotal character in the film. Because of this, Mari became an afterthought throughout the majority of Evangelion 2.0 scripts, and would only be inserted after every other character fulfilled their role. This resulted in Mari having an inconsequential role in between the film's major set pieces throughout the majority of the drafts. In the end, Anno settled for giving Mari the opening scene of the film, using Ryoji Kaji as an element of familiarity so that Mari would not appear in isolation. The scene, interestingly enough, also happened to be the opening set piece of his very first draft. After ensuring that Asuka had enough involvement during the first and second acts of the film, Mari was given two additional scenes to connect her with Shinji. The first of these scenes was the brainchild of Tsuramaki, who suggested that as a way to differentiate Mari from the other characters, she was to parachute on the roof of Shinji's school during their first meeting. The second scene was Mari's fight with the 10th Angel, which capitalized on Asuka being out of commission, and allowed Mari to have an action scene, as well as an additional scene with Shinji. Though these scenes did not propel the plot forward, they did lay the groundwork for Mari's personality. Mari's few scenes cemented her as carefree, yet competent, and as someone who derided happiness from piloting their EVA. This eventual characterization was the result of Tsuramaki's direction in Mari's dialogues and scenes, as well as from Anno's insistence that she sing 365 Step March prior to her fight with the Third Angel. These incidental factors laid the groundwork for Mari's subsequent role in 3.0. Before the addition of Evangelion 3.0, minus 120 minutes into the canon, Mari's next chronological appearance was during Unit 1's recovery in the opening scene of 3.0. Here we got to see Asuka and Mari's relationship as a result of working together at Villa for 14 years. What we learn is that Mari is unbothered by Asuka's abrasive personality, even calling her princess as a playful jest. She also seems to enjoy teasing Asuka about her feelings for Shinji, when she jokes that Asuka spoke to him only to see his face. Though these details seem to be inconsequential, they reveal an evolution in Mari's characterization. Though Mari was always meant to be viewed as having a casual attitude, in contrast to most characters' rigidity, 3.0's depiction of Mari sees her as unconcerned with others' opinions of herself, using her relationship with Asuka as a display of her indifference. 3.0 further developed her contrasting personality from the tone of the film, using her as a sort of comic relief. This is evidenced by her quips during Shinji's escape from the Vunder, when she yells at Miss Lookalike to at least say hi, and during Unit 13's battle with Asuka, calling Miss Lookalike straight-laced. This isn't to say that Mari was meant to bring levity to the film, but rather create an aura of mystery behind her. Mari's role in 3.0 served a much more nuanced purpose by combining her light-hearted personality with an unparalleled knowledge of both Gendo and Sella's plan, as well as the mechanics of the third impact. In essence, Mari's role in 3.0 was meant to create dissonance between her playful personality and the gravity of the information she knew. During the Battle of Central Dogma, Mari discloses cryptic exposition regarding Unit 13 and Mark 9's nature when she shows concern regarding Unit 13's lack of an AT field, as well as when she urges Miss Lookalike to abandon Mark 9 before she becomes a vessel of the atoms. Mari's knowledge then gets juxtaposed with Asuka's raw emotions, giving us the understanding that Mari is the most competent of the two. This is evidenced when Asuka shoots the 10th Angel's core out of desperation, but is urged to stop by Mari because she claims there's nothing either of them can do. Mari being the only source of exposition during this battle and subsequent third impact is not only meant to be used as a way to fill in the audience on the seemingly complicated sequence of events leading to another impact, but it's also meant to tease Mari's origins and importance for the overall plot. 
When Mari deduces Gendo's plan after Kaoru was assigned as the 13th Angel, we feel intrigued towards Mari's hidden knowledge, and eager to know what she knows, and why she knows what she knows. After all, out of all of the characters that we'd expect to know what was going on, Misato and Ritsuko would be the most likely, not a happy-go-lucky character that we barely know anything about. Now though, it's likely that both Misato and Ritsuko knew what was going on. It's interesting that there was a conscious choice to have Mari provide the exposition, while purposely depicting Asuka as brash and unaware of the extent of the situation. This conscious decision, then, was undoubtedly meant to paint Mari as different from the rest of the pilots, with her knowledge teasing a consequential origin story. This leads to 3.0 plus 1.0, where Mari plays a pivotal role in concluding Evangelion. The film opens with Mari taking on an entire army of EVA units, including the 42As, 42Bs, and 44Cs, using a damaged Unit 8 with a provisional set of arms. Mari proves successful and allows Villa to decorize Paris, allowing them to gain access to EU Nerve's arsenal and equipment. Mari doesn't appear again until Asuka and Shinji board the Vunder. Presumably while Shinji and Asuka were taking residence at Village 3, Villa needed to reappropriate EU Nerve's EVA and Jet Alone spare parts for use on Unit 8 and Unit 2. Mari's role during that time then was to assist in the preparation for the Vunder's final assault on Gendo. While Mari was off-screen working with Villa, the film allocated the first third of the runtime to focus on Shinji and Miss Lookalike's relationship, as well as to show how Shinji resolved to atone for his past mistakes. This part of the film, then, served a twofold purpose. Aside from allowing Shinji to have an active role in the conclusion of the film, the choice to redevelop Shinji's relationship with Rei through Miss Lookalike was meant to give Shinji, Rei, and the audience closure for their subplot from 2.0, and allow Shinji to establish other relationships later in the film. This paved the way for Mari to play an important role for Shinji's character development. But before this happens, Asuka and Shinji set in motion their reconciliation when Asuka takes a detour to speak to Shinji before she and Mari depart on their mission. The next scenes involving Mari see her offering brief exposition for major moments in the battle, such as explaining Gendo's plan to use Asuka's angel form and delineating the properties of her overlapped Unit 8. Mari then acts as Shinji's tether to the real world to allow him to confront Gendo in the anti-universe, but ultimately, Mari's role remains thematically insignificant up until her dialogue with Fuyutsuki. During Gendo's additional impact, Mari pays a visit to Fuyutsuki and converses before he becomes LCL. The first thing we have to note about this conversation is that Mari had no objective in seeing him, meaning that Mari went through the trouble of boarding the opera ship simply to say goodbye. Since we later see in Gendo's flashback that Mari was one of the researchers that worked alongside Yui, we can assume that she was fond of Fuyutsuki despite their differences. This bittersweet conversation between old colleagues reveals that Mari knew that Fuyutsuki was assisting Gendo because he also loved Yui. This is evident when she states that Fuyutsuki's goal happened to overlap with Gendo's. She also expresses her motivation to fight with Villa when she told Fuyutsuki that she'd rather not end humanity for Gendo and Fuyutsuki's sake. Fuyutsuki then adds an interesting piece of information that suggests that he perceives Mari as a traitor by calling her Maria Iscariot. Now there's two possible assumptions we can make from this piece of information, both of which hint at the same thing. The first assumption is that Maria Iscariot was the name she went by during her years as Fuyutsuki, Gendo, and Yui's colleague. Or in other words, that this is Mari's birth name before she changed it at some point when she joined Ipea. The second assumption we can make is that this is the name given to her at some point after a supposed betrayal and defection to a rival organization. Perhaps after Mari realized what Gendo and Fuyutsuki's motivations were after Yui was lost in Unit 1's entry plug. Regardless, the importance of this name retroactively changes Mari's role in the Rebuild series. This is because the name Maria Iscariot alludes to two biblical characters with Maria alluding to Mary Magdalene and with Iscariot referring to Judas Iscariot. These allusions, then, are meant to create the subtext of Mari's past relationships with Fuyutsuki and Gendo, without having to create an entire narrative. The first element of this subtext is Mari's relation to Mary Magdalene. Though this relationship is mostly vacuous and mainly meant to give Mari a biblical first name to pair with the surname Iscariot, it's still interesting to note that according to the Gospels of Luke and Mark, Mary Magdalene was a financial sponsor for Jesus' ministry. Historically then, Mary Magdalene was seen as one of Jesus' greatest assets and followers outside of the Twelve Disciples. Perhaps then, Mari is meant to be similarly seen as one of Villa's most important female assets in their mission to save humanity. Mari's parallels with Judas Iscariot, on the other hand, are most definitely intentional. 
Judas Iscariot has been associated with betrayal for over 2,000 years because of his role in turning Jesus over to the Jewish tribunal despite being one of his disciples. Mari from Gendo and Fuyutsuki's perspective then played Judas's role by being one of their colleagues, learning the inner workings of the first ancestral race's artifacts, learning how to create future impacts, and helping them set up Yui's contact experiment, only to defect when Yui's soul was lost. This is why Mari's relationship to Fuyutsuki mirrors Judas's relationship to Jesus, because from Fuyutsuki's point of view, Mari showed no accountability when she refused to forsake humanity for the sake of Yui. The implication of Mari being referred to as Maria Iscariot then, retroactively changes her depictions from 2.0 all the way to 3.0 plus 1.0. This single piece of dialogue became the payoff for Mari's superior knowledge. For example, prior to 3.0 plus 1.0, Mari's knowledge of Unit 2's beast mode seemed a bit jarring considering that we had never seen it being used in the entire series. The introduction of Beast Mode called in question Asuka's knowledge about her own Evangelion unit, considering that it could have been used during her fight with the mass-produced Evas during the end of Evangelion. After the revelation that Mari was one of the original researchers in the production of Evangelions, we can understand that she would have more knowledge about the back-end functions of the Evangelions than even the most seasoned pilots. Though Asuka is later seen using a different kind of Beast Mode in 3.0, we can assume that during the 14-year time skip. Asuka would have learned a thing or two from Mari after battling other subsequent angels together. Mari's use as a source of exposition during 3.0 also gets a payoff as we learn that the reason her knowledge about impacts is comparable to that of Gendo's is because she was a colleague of his. Mari's connection to Gendo, Fuyutsuki, and Yui then causes her to serve the most pivotal role in defeating Gendo. From what we understand about Masato and Ritsuko, their roles for Nerve were always compartmentalized. Neither of them understood Gendo's plans, with Masato having been lied to in Neon Genesis Evangelion about Adam being Lilith and the origins of the dummy plugs, among other pieces of information. Ritsuko, on the other hand, though significantly better versed on the Human Instrumentality project, was unaware of Gendo's motivations to see Yui again. Mari, however, knew everything, and as a result, her appearance in 2.0 marks the origin of Villa's inception. Though it is largely implied that Villa was founded by Ryoji Kaji, him having acted as a triple agent between Nerve, Sella, and Gendo, it's interesting to note that in the Rebuild series, he first appears on Bethany base overlooking Mari's engagement with the Third Angel. This could hint at a link between the two, with Mari having briefed Kaji on her knowledge prior to her engagement with the Third Angel. It is entirely possible that Kaji and Mari had planned to start a breakaway organization on different fronts, with Mari acting as a source of intel on Gendo's goals, and Kaji providing information about Sela. Regardless if this is the case or not, Mari is supposed to be seen as an inside source of both Gendo and Fuyutsuki's plans, considering that she was the insider who betrayed them. So whether or not she founded Villa is irrelevant, because it is implied that her insider knowledge helped Villa win in the end. Another example of Mari using her expertise was that when Gendo had gone into Minus Space, Mari consumed one of Adam's vessels to give her the ability to navigate Minus Space after it became apparent that the Vunder lost that ability following Unit 1's removal. Mari's quick thinking then allowed Shinji to travel into Minus Space without being lost indefinitely. Though it is implied that anyone could travel into Minus Space, it was also implied that unless one had access to Adam or Lilith's power, they would never be able to make it back. So though Shinji was willing to do that, it was thanks to Mari's quick thinking that both Asuka and Shinji made it back. Mari's final role in Evangelion then becomes largely symbolic. Once Yui was shown to take the sacrifice needed to fulfill Shinji's wish, Shinji gets pulled into the reality he created with Mari immediately following him with her appearance on the beach. Mari states that she made it, although barely, implying that her L barrier was about to give way before the final sacrifice was made. Since Shinji was being monitored by Mari in her overlapped Unit 8, she was able to pull him out to the real world as reality was restarting. The significance of Mari being on the beach, and later in the train station with Shinji however, means that she succeeded in her mission. Not only was her presence in the final scene meant to show us that she completed her objective, but it was also meant to show us that with her help, Shinji finally moved on. Despite the fact that Shinji's new world deleted all Evas, Shinji kept his DSS choker, only for Mari to remove it. This symbolized that Shinji needed Mari to completely move on from the horrors of his past lives, by embracing change. You see, only Mari could help Shinji live a new life, because if it was anyone else, Shinji wouldn't have learned anything, since everyone he crossed paths with represented a lesson. 
Asuka's lesson is that attraction doesn't always create healthy relationships. Ray's lesson is that a partner shouldn't be a replacement for a lost parent or loved one. Kaoru's lesson is that a partner shouldn't be the solution to one's problems. And Mari's lesson is that a partner should be someone we want, but not need. Before I explain why it makes sense for Mari to be the one with Shinji at the end of the Evangelion continuity, I have to explain the reason why this ending feels odd. For over 25 years, the Evangelion continuity followed Shinji's struggle as an EVA pilot and his attempts to save the world and find happiness. Because of this, it is only natural that the conclusion of his story center around his triumph. What ended up happening instead was that the end of 3.0 plus 1.0 depicted a shared triumph between Evangelion's protagonist and the supporting character who helped him achieve it. But if this is the case, how exactly did this ending also depict Mari's triumph? When we look at Mari's history, we find a character whose passion led her to create humanity's greatest adversary in Gendo. Not only did her research contribute to Gendo's understanding of the first ancestral race's powers, but it also contributed for all intents and purposes to Yui's death. Mari being the woman in the photograph meant that she was not just Yui's co-worker, but also her friend. We can imagine the amount of guilt Mari must have felt for contributing to Yui's disappearance in the entry plug. To make matters worse, there is a high likelihood that Mari's reversion to her 14-year-old self resulted from a successful contact experiment, meaning her guilt was probably survivor's guilt. So though Mari's motivation to fight Gendo and Fuyutsuki seemed logical, due to the repercussions their success would entail, Mari fought for something more personal. You see, Mari lost Yui just like Gendo and Fuyutsuki, but instead of trying to look for Yui in the entry plug, she found her in Shinji. Gendo's realization that Yui had lived on in Shinji was 28 years too late, and his obsession to see Yui again led him to neglect the living remnant of Yui that actually mattered. Mari, on the other hand, understood that Yui was lost forever, and that the best way to honor her memory was to save her only son. This is why Mari had to be in the ending with Shinji, because her success was tied to Shinji's, and only through him could she pay her debt to Yui. But this isn't the only reason. You see, beyond the angels, Sela, and Gendo, Shinji's greatest adversary was loneliness. His depression stemmed from an inability to connect to others, originating from his abandonment as a child, which persisted throughout the continuity. As a result, for Shinji's story to truly conclude, he needed to defeat the Hedgehog's Dilemma, which is why Mari's inclusion in the end needed to happen, as a way to show that Shinji had outgrown his abandonment issues and learned to connect to others. What's interesting is that Shinji wasn't the only one with the Hedgehog's Dilemma. Characters such as Gendo, Misato, and Asuka also suffered from a fear of intimacy, Fortunately for them, they found their solutions before the end of the film, with Gendo finding Yui before his death, Misato sacrificing herself so that she could be a mother in Shinji's new world, and Asuka finding closure with her feelings for Shinji before getting to spend the rest of her life with Kensuke. Rei, Kaoru, Kaji, and the others too were given an opportunity to find happiness and intimacy in the new world. In the end, this left Mari as Shinji's chance to start anew and to live a life without rehashing the missteps of his past. Mari then represents Shinji's new beginning, or if we want to get cheeky, Neon Genesis. But hold on, hold on, we've seen this before, haven't we? I mean, knowing what we know about Hideaki Anno, if Mari's role represents a new beginning, and Shinji's role represents triumph over depression, does that mean Mari was modeled after Hideaki's wife, Mayoko Anno? There is no doubt Mari's thematic use in Evangelion mirrors people's assumptions of Moyoko's role in Hideaki's life. One of these assumptions being that Moyoko played a role in rescuing Hideaki from his depression. Though Hideaki has been on the record stating that Neon Genesis Evangelion was inspired by his depression, Hideaki has never attributed his mental health recovery to Moyoko. In fact, despite Hideaki suffering from sporadic depressive episodes, his four-year battle with depression that inspired Neon Genesis Evangelion had ended two years before meeting Moyoko, this meeting happening after Neon Genesis Evangelion had concluded. But what about Moyoko's personality? Is she not the basis for Mari? Well, no. Despite Moyoko's personality being significantly more jovial than Hideaki's, she's not really similar to Mari. According to Hideaki's foreword featured in Moyoko's manga titled Insufficient Direction, Moyoko is a woman who battles loneliness and alienation and is barely holding her emotional balance in check. So in other words, Moyoko is a real person, not an idealized savior fit for symbolically offering the protagonist a new beginning. But don't take it from me, Ano himself has stated, this theory is merely only the assumption and speculation of a handful of people, with Evangelion's official Twitter page adding, 
At the time of production, this would have been impossible. Mari's personality, as well as Asuka and others, was created by director Tsurumaki's hand, rather than Anno. It's a bit of fun for the audience to interpret characters and storylines as they wish, and Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 is a playground of intellectual fan speculation. That being said, it is sad to see the staff and their families disparaged by baseless assumptions, so we will clearly deny that this is the case. So no, Mari is not based off of Miyoko, although superficially, we can say that she parallels Miyoko more so than other characters, eventually playing the role of Shinji's buoyant significant other. The similarities are there, but ultimately, they are coincidental. Mari's role cannot be equated to that of an individual's. The reverberations of her role are too big for that. After all, following her creation as a means to add novelty, she eventually evolved to become the representation of a fresh start. Her goal to make up for Yui's loss led her to view Shinji as the continuation of Yui's existence. The significance of this is that unlike her colleagues who looked to the past for redemption, Mari saw the future as an opportunity to start over, pick up the pieces, and create an illustrious world. I'd like to give a big thanks to Funk Squad member Rokus Art for requesting this video. These videos are possible thanks to all y'all's support, so thanks again, and as always, I shall see yous down the road.